Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Hold Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Hello and welcome to Daughterhood, the podcast. I am your host, Roseanne Corcoran, Daughterhood Circle Leader and Primary Caregiver. Daughterhood is the creation of Ann Tumlinson, who has worked on the front lines in the healthcare field for many years and has seen the multitude of challenges caregivers face. Our mission is to support and build confidence in women who are managing their parents' care. Daughterhood is what happens when we put our lives on hold to take care of our parents. We recognize this care is too much for one person to handle alone. We want to help you see your efforts are not only good enough, they are actually heroic. Our podcast goal is to bring you some insight into navigating the healthcare system, provide resources for you as a caregiver, as well as for you as a person, and help you know that you don't have to endure this on your own. Join me in Daughterhood. Here at Daughterhood, we receive numerous questions regarding governmental policy and the myriad of ways it affects the healthcare system and each of us, both as patients and as caregivers. It was my pleasure to speak with two experts in the field and friends of the podcast, Howard Gleckman, Senior Fellow at the Urban Institute, as well as a columnist at Forbes, editor of Tax Vox blog for the Tax Policy Center, and author of his book, Caring for Our Parents, and creator of Daughterhood, Ann Tumlinson, who is also the founder and CEO of ATI Advisory, a national research and consulting firm that shapes public policy and business strategy to reform care delivery for individuals with complex care needs and their families. We discuss many issues like the challenges of trying to change policy, the importance of lawmakers hearing and understanding the challenges caregivers face, how policy shapes the care we receive, and the importance of making our voices heard. I hope you enjoy our conversation. In the contentious 2022 midterm elections, we were inundated about the importance of our vote, who was elected, and the roles that they would play. Without sounding partisan, why is it important to elect the right people? So, Roseanne, you know, the right people doesn't necessarily mean partisan. Okay. Okay. Right? I mean, I mean, th- there are, as you know, as Ann knows very well, there are Democrats who don't care about this issue at all, and there are Republicans right. who care a lot. So, so you, I, I think it's okay to say the right people because it's okay. It's not partisan necessarily. Okay. So, why is it important? What I what I found in in the years of watching Congress and aging policy is that you really can divide members of Congress into two groups. And it's not Democrats and Republicans or liberals and conservatives. It's people who have had personal experience with this issue and people who have not. Yes. And what I've seen is actually an interesting transformation sometimes where people who didn't care about this issue became caregivers and suddenly cared a lot about the issue. And people who have not had the experience, it's hard to... It's hard to even explain to them what it's like being a caregiver, how hard it is, how much it overwhelms all of your life. And and when you try to explain it to them, it it just doesn't compute. The other issue that's important when you think about Congress is a lot of the work is done by staff people who tend to be very young in their 20s and 30s, and they've had no experience with this. You know, they barely know their grandparents who probably live in some distant city. And um, explaining to them what this is like and why it's important to have legislation is, a, is also very important and very challenging. So getting the right people, if the right people means people who are aware of the needs of family caregivers and the needs of older, frail older adults, uh, it really is important. Yeah. And I would just say, I this is your power to reminding me of a, um, just a, a Briefly, I was some years ago testifying before the Energy and Commerce Committee. And um, so I'm sort of sitting there as a Democratic witness, and I've got the Dems on one side of the room and the Republics on the other. And there was a lot of, you know, kind of, I don't know, some partisan bickering, et cetera, and, you know, grandstanding on both sides. And then there is this, and I wish I could remember the congressman 
on the Republican side who looked at me and he was like, my dad has Alzheimer's and we have money and we still can't take care of him at home. It's too hard. And we, the two of us just locked eyes in that moment. And I knew he knew and understood all of the nuances and complexities of what I was trying to communicate. And just so just to your point, it really was that there were, I got a much better response from him than I did from some of the Democrats. So, you know, it's not, it wasn't, it didn't feel partisan to me at all. That, it, I mean, it's very interesting and I be- totally believe that, but it makes me feel like, oh my God, well, if they don't, and we talk about this in the daughterhood circles all the time, you don't know what it's like until you're in it. And then you're in it and you're like, wow, this can't be the way it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yes, quite frankly, this is how it is. But but then we have to hope that there's somebody who's making the decisions that also gets that. And that's really kind of depressing to me hearing. I, I fully understand what you mean. And I, I agree with you because they have to have that feeling to say, no, no, we have to pass this. We've got to get this done. Yeah. But uh, uh, wow. I mean. It, it, that explains a lot. That explains so, so a lot. The other really important thing about this is not only do they have to understand it and not only do they have to make it important, but somebody up there has to make it their most important issue. Right. W- w- one of the things, and, and Roseanne, you and I have talked about this before on this podcast. Mm-hmm. One of yeah. the things that was so disappointing was that in the wake of COVID, when 700,000 older adults died, and countless hundreds of thousands of others got sick, and 200,000 staff and residents of of long-term care facilities died, Congress was presented with a menu of things to do about it and did almost nothing. And the reason was not because they didn't know or didn't care. It was because it wasn't the most important thing. There were other things that that got to the top of the list, and it fell down the, the hit parade. As usual. As usual, as always. As always. And, and and I think that's part of the problem. There, There's not been, frankly, since Ted Kennedy died, there's not been a senator who really was willing or a member of Congress who was really willing to make this a priority. Right. To make this their signature issue and to push and push and push. And that's what we heard was that there were members who were sympathetic and there was leadership that was willing to put it on the list, but then ultimately the list got narrowed down and, and, and we lost out. We didn't, we didn't get a tax credit, family caregiver tax credit fell off, family medical leave fell off, increased Medicaid federal funding for home and community services fell off, all those things fell off. So for me, it's like going forward, like what, what has to happen for this to become less of like a boutique side issue and more of a fundamental issue. I, I'm interested. I, I don't know. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, Roseanne, your answer. That, your no, answer that was, and that was my next question. If, <laughs> if they can't do something on that, what, what has to happen? So the good news is I'm grasping here for good news straws, but the, the good news is that the president of the United States made this an important enough issue that, that he, he made a number of very dramatic proposals. Biden's American Jobs Plan. He, he would have increased Medicaid home and community-based funding by $400 billion. He, he would have uh, uh, increased funding for a whole range of, of programs that are funded under what's called the Older Americans Act by tens of billions of dollars. Uh, a, a number of big dramatic changes that the president was willing to put his name on, and and that had never happened before. Really not since Lyndon Johnson in 1965 was anybody talking about Medicaid and and old people. So that's something. And even though Congress didn't do anything about it, uh, it, it, it put the issue higher up on people's agendas. And the other thing to keep in mind is, is it takes a long time for Congress to act. You know, we're all used to, you know, watching television and, you know, somebody raises an issue with, you know, the beginning of the show and an hour later, the, 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 the world changes. 
And that's not how it goes in Congress. It takes years, three years, four years, five years for an issue to, to first surface and then, and then finally get, get it, uh, enacted. So in my optimistic moments, I have fewer of them as time goes on, but in my optimistic moments, I think, you know, this was a start and, and, um, uh, and time, as time goes on, uh, there, there is better chance that Congress will uh, respond. In my pessimist moments, I said, if they couldn't do it after COVID, uh, when will they do it? Right. Yeah, I, I guess I, in my, my, my optimistic view of this is what I've heard some of the really smart political people say is part of what was missing, in addition to the champion, so this is kind of lessons going forward, not, I don't want to spend too much time dwelling on what didn't happen, but part of what was missing was like the sense of groundswell, honestly, from the grassroots. So what so what did happen? Uh, drug pricing legislation happened. Every single person going to the pharmacy for, you know, has been like, are you kidding me? What the heck, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, is going on with this? And so um, I think that care for, for older adults and family caregiving just hadn't, just had, while we had these COVID issues, you know, in terms of sort of like really impacting every single family, we were, we're not quite there. However, <laughs> I just want to share that, and because I, I look at these numbers all the time, is that what's fascinating about the demographics, everybody talks about you know, the graying of the population or the aging of the population, but the really dramatic thing that's going to happen in just three years is that the rate of growth in the population that is over age 85 is going to become the fastest growing part of the American population. Wow. So like everything in American politics, we like to wait until something is a total catastrophe before we actually act. And I do think it could, I mean, I don't mean to be, you know, Debbie Downer here, negative, negative, but I do think we are, what I am seeing, and Howard, I'm interested in whether or not you agree. Howard and I like to go to breakfast and talk about these things, but we're going to just do it here instead. <laughs> do it here. Absolutely. We're just going to do it here, but I, but we, we like to have disagreements, but, you know, so fastest growing part of the population over age 85, it's going to accelerate really rapidly from 2025 to 2030. When, when, when the rate of growth accelerates, that's when we always see trends really start to take hold. Okay. So why is it a catastrophe? I mean, for everybody who's listening, if you're a caregiver, you kind of already know, <laughs> but, but you know, what Howard and I are seeing out there right now is some very disturbing. So we have a Disturbing trends in that, you know, I think the nursing home industry, which is the one and only setting, like it or not, where we actually have funding guaranteed for care. So if you run mm -hmm. out of money <laughs> and you need really high levels of care, essentially you are entitled to, and I'm oversimplifying dramatically here, but you are entitled to a nursing home bed. But that sector and that industry is really in my opinion, kind of imploding right now. So we're actually running into a situation where hospitals are trying to discharge people and they can't. And so, so, so that infrastructure is kind of falling apart. The other source of funding for care is Medicaid home and community-based services and states are paying. I was just talking to a guy the other day who runs a Medicaid home care agency and a private pay home care agency. And he's sort of like, no problem recruiting aides for his private pay. He can pay them $20 an hour. He gets paid $20 an hour by the state. And then he's paying his aides and Medicaid $12 an hour. So point being like, he can't recruit over there. So we, so I'm just sort of watching like the one place, the one safety net kind of like so fragile and so teetering at precisely the moment that all of these people are going to need care. So. It feels to me like a moment where we have to just hit more of a rock bottom 
and families are going to be like, it's just going to be every family. And then the hue and cry will be loud enough. And then we need to be ready with like, what is the solution? And I, I think we have in the policy community where we have literally for 20 years been working on these, still not particularly prepared to deliver that message. But anyway, Howard, that was a lot. I'm interested in what you agree with I, and what you disagree totally. with. Totally. <laughs> yeah. So so a lot to unpack there. It's a couple of a couple of things in response. So one of them is, and you mentioned the labor shortage issue. Th- th- this is already a crisis. Right. Now it, it's a crisis that isn't getting a lot of attention because who are the, the 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 care workers? They're women. They're immigrants. They're people of color. They're people who don't have a lot of influence in Washington. But the people they work for have influence in Washington. And that labor shortage is truly is catastrophic. It was terrible before COVID. It's much worse now. The industry's lost hundreds of thousands of care workers who just aren't coming back. They're taking jobs. It's it, it's a lot safer. It's a lot easier, and you get paid more to be a warehouse worker than you do to care for a, a frail older adult. So that labor shortage is a, is a problem that isn't going away. And is, is, if, if it isn't confronted, people are going to be showing up with the proverbial pitchfork saying, I, I, I can't get anybody to help mom at any price. Right. The question of how this change happens, you know, Anne is great at producing data. Mm-hmm. I, I write about data, including the data that Anne produces. Data is only part of the story. You need to combine that with narrative. Yes. Families, and I understand people don't have time and they don't have energy and all the rest of it, but it's so important for family caregivers to say, to mem- to stand up in, in, in town hall meetings, and to say to their member of Congress, to say to their state legislator, let me tell you what my life is like. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you stereotypical 50-year-old woman who's caring for her mom. Let me tell you, I had to quit my job in order to do this. And let me tell you what that's meant for my family. And I think going back to what we were talking about before, I think members of Congress don't really understand this unless they live through it. And and part of the job is to help people understand it. Right. The, The nursing home question is a really interesting one. You know, nursing homes are imploding. It's a, it's a strange phenomenon actually that, that the nursing home industry is collapsing at the same time that when people buy nursing homes, the per bed price is higher than it's ever been. So you sort of look at this and say, how weird is this? People can't make any money in the nursing home business, but the people buying nursing homes are paying more money than they ever paid before to buy them. So so this kind of completely crazy environment that that people are trying to understand. The last thing I'll say about it, and again, it just kind of punctuates what Ann said, is, is we're seeing this growing gap between the private pay world and the Medicaid world. If you're rich, you can still get plenty of good care. You can move into a continuing care community. You can move into a high-end assisted living. You can move into a $15,000 a month memory care unit if you've got the dough, but that's a tiny slice of the population. Then we have the very poor people, the lifetime poor who are on Medicaid, and we can take care of them, not especially well, but we can take care of them. You, you know, As Ann said, you're entitled if you're poor enough uh, you're entitled to a bed in a nursing home. You're probably going to be sharing a room with a stranger, but you can get into a nursing home. The people I worry about the most are middle-income people who aren't rich enough to afford thirteen or fourteen thousand dollars a month and aren't poor enough to get on the Medicaid. And what happens to them? Those are the people whose daughters have to quit their quit their jobs, who aren't getting the care at all. You know, we, we've talked, I think, before about when I when I back when I was doing research for the book I wrote on this, the, the most shocking thing, the most absolutely shocking conversation I ever had was with with EMTs who would tell me about what it was like to come to somebody's house who had died days earlier. Um, and 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 the, the only reason they knew it was because the, the postal worker or somebody had smelled something bad. And these are women who were living alone you know, in here in, in the Washington area in a row house that they've been in for 50 years, raised their families in, their husbands had died, their children moved away, and they just died and nobody even knew. Yeah. And that's the fate that a lot of those soon to be 80 year olds that Ann was talking about are looking at if we don't do something to fix the system. It's very discouraging. I, know. I don't understand how with nursing homes being the highest to buy right now, 
how does this happen? How did we get here? How do we go from, from here? Like, how does this happen that this is, this is where we are? Well, I'm going to take a really big, 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 big picture. So I think we created a safety net for a very, what was a very small part of the population historically. The crazy thing is that what we have effectively done as a society is made it possible to live these incredibly long lives, what we call longevity gains or lifespan gains. But what we haven't done (laughs) is kind of created an environment, a healthcare system or an environment that enables us to live long health spans. So, you know, anybody, anybody who has a parent over age or family member, I should say, over age 75, especially over age 80, you know, you, you, you understand this very intuitively now because you're seeing, and there's an enormous amount of variation, but you're seeing it, right? You know, people's bodies begin to break down but we have this incredible sort of set of tools that enable us to at least address enough of that sort of those clinical issues that we can keep people alive for a really long time. And so we have just, despite the fact we knew this was happening, you know, 20 years ago, but we just haven't, there's, you know, for all the reasons we've been talking about, we haven't updated the infrastructure you know, meaning when, what I mean by that is sort of like, just like, think of it as like the roads and bridges of the care delivery system. They just don't exist. We haven't built that, you know, for the realities of old age in this country and really across the globe. Um, Although I think other countries have done a better job in preparing and some of them are even farther ahead than us in terms of the grain, but that's that, you know, and it's expensive. It's expensive. This is not, I mean, I think the resources are there. We're spending them in ways that we shouldn't be now, but it's still, you know, we're we're talking about paying other human beings to do really hard things for other human beings. There's not a robot or an app that you can sort of, we can get, technology can help, but it still doesn't change. Like somebody has to be taken to the bathroom. Yes. There's, a, there's another new study that came out just today that confirms what we've been hearing for years and years and years, which is the United States spends more money per capita on medical care than any other country on the planet. Yep. At the same time, we know that the United States government spends less than almost any developed country on supports and services. When you add the two up, the United States and most other major developed countries spend almost exactly the same amount of money. The difference is we spend it all on medical care and they spend it on supports and services. They get longer life expectancy than we do. They get families that are more satisfied. We all know that. As Ann said, we've known that for decades, but we can't bring ourselves to do anything about it. So why can't we do anything about it? So one of the reasons, of course, is there's a big medical care establishment out there that likes it the way it is. This is really kind of nice getting all this money. You know, the, the, the classic, you know, stereotypical example, if you have a heart attack, Medicare will spend whatever it takes to take care of you. They'll do big heart surgery. They'll keep you in the hospital. They'll do post-acute rehab. They'll spend whatever it costs. doesn't make any difference. If you have the wrong disease, if you have, let's say, dementia, where there is no medical treatment, the medical system will pay or Medicare will pay nothing, essentially. And you sort of sit there and you say, this, this is kind of crazy. Why is it that people get one disease and, and the government spends unlimited amounts of money to care for them and they get a different disease and the government spends nothing? But that's what we've created. And, and Anne's right. You know, in, in 1965, when we created this system, people didn't live a really long time. And dementia, for example, is a disease of people over 80. People, not a lot of people live to be 80. So they didn't think of it. It didn't occur to them. Somebody once said that the problem is that Medicare was created by 
a, a bunch of old guys to take care of old guys. And they, 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 they didn't think about how things were going to change. And, and, and what Ann said is exactly right. You know, the change in medical technology has made it possible for us to increase life expectancy in the United States. From the turn of the 20th century, you live on average in, in your 40s. You live to be 48 or 49 years old. Now you live to be 79. An increase in 30 years in life expectancy in, 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 a, in a century is unbelievable. Uh, life expectancy didn't change practically at all from biblical times until the, the 1950s. You know, we got penicillin, which made an extraordinary difference. We had changes in public health. We had, you know, indoor bathrooms. These kinds of things made extraordinary improvements in life expectancy in the United States. And not, and by the way, when I say this, people say, well, that's just because of, you know, life expectancy at birth and it's, you know, infants are living longer. But if you look at life expectancy at age 65, it's doubled in the last 50 years. It's gone from seven years to 15 years. So we figured out how to help people live longer. We haven't figured out how to take care of them during that period of time when they become frail. And th that's where the system has fallen apart. And there needs to be more money in the long-term care system. Some of that's going to come externally, but some of it probably ought to be coming from the medical side. But how do you get the medical people to understand that? Yeah, my, um, my mother was telling me a story yesterday about, so she's 82 and she's having um, a lot of speech therapy right now because she's having some trouble swallowing and she's very healthy, but she, I we were noticing, right, you know, she was starting to cough a lot and choke. Um, so she's getting a lot of this. So her speech therapist told her this story about a woman who had such severe reflux and weakening of the muscles that she started aspirating a lot, you know, and this, it was this cascade of things where she ended up with somebody basically wanting to put her on a feeding tube. And because she was on a feeding tube, she was then isolated from all of her friends who, with whom she used to go out to lunch and da, 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 da. So, you know, it's just like this, and, and then finally, somebody figured out a way to just treat the reflux through a, a number of different sort of alternative and homeopathic and sort of gentle ways, you know, and like, she got off the feeding tube and she could resume her life. But just that's such a classic example of like, oh, you're aspirating, you're ending up in the hospital. That's very dangerous. We don't want that to happen again. So we're going to put you on a feeding tube and the feeding tube isolates you and then you get depression. You know, it's just, that's a good like there's our medical system, not only is it highly technical and really advanced, but it's also quite honestly, the business model of healthcare is to do things. You know, the more you do, the more you get paid. And it's not that any one doctor or hospital is sort of nefarious in any way. It's just like that's ingrained now, you know, just, just like do, 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 instead of trying to take a step back and see how we can adjust or underlying issues. And so that's kind of on the sort of policy and change and polit politics and stuff. I think one of the things that I don't know how to solve for, that I don't know how to fix, but I'm really committed to through daughterhood is every single family encounters all of this. And then they set about essentially on their own, you know, setting up their own complete and total healthcare and long-term care delivery system within their own home. And they don't, I think because when it happens to you, first of all, it's, it's traumatic and it's overwhelming and you kind of can't believe it's like that, but it, 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 because of just the nature of what you are having to do in that moment, you don't think to yourself, this is a political problem. This is systemic problem. This is this is unacceptable. <laughs> like, and there needs to be the, the community and the politics and the sort of we all live in this country together and we should be able to change this together so we can have a reasonable society in five years when everybody's going through it. So I, I think people don't like Howard, to your point about, you know, I wrote it down. Let me tell you what my life is like. I don't know that they under, they can really function in that moment to be like, this isn't an individual problem. This is a political problem. I don't know how to help make that connection for people. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because, you know, you think about it, it's a political problem in a couple of ways. It's, it's a political problem in the sense of the money. 
that this is a whole industry that's sort of been built up on government money. You know, I, I, I have a joke with people, you know, the, the, the long-term care industry is a little bit like the defense industry. Yeah. You know, all of its money comes from the government. <laughs> and, and because of that, the government and its rules drive all of the business decisions. And when people complain, for example, about why nursing homes, or at least some nursing homes are so bad, part of it is because the government in a perverse way pays them to do it the way they do it. Mm -hmm. Any good businessman is going to go to the payer and, and say, this is how you want me to do it. You get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, it gets really kind of boring for people to hear about, you know, regulatory process and administrative rules and all that. But the truth is, that's the, that's the stuff, that's the policy that the government is using to create the incentives that the long-term care industry responds to. And if they tell you that, to take a, the COVID example, if the government says to nursing homes, you are you are prohibited from allowing families to come and visit your loved ones in a nursing home because we're afraid it's going to help spread the COVID infection. The nursing homes are going to say, okay, they're going to argue about it. They're going to say, okay, we're going to close the doors. And then when people come back and say, do you know what you're doing in terms of creating social isolation? The nursing homes are going to say, well, but the government told us this is how we had to do it. And, you know, the funny thing about that is Anne and I and a few colleagues wrote a paper at the beginning of COVID saying, don't do this. This is a really bad idea. And nobody listened. Uh, they eventually did, but it took a while. And, and that's what happens. You know, there, there was a time when the, when the, the government said to hospitals, you, it said nursing homes, you have to accept COVID positive patients. And the nursing home said, well, okay, that's what you're telling us we got to do. That's what we're going to do. And the Biden administration, again, to its credit, is trying to rethink in some fundamental ways the way it's regulating nursing homes, how it pays. Some of those ideas may be good ones. Some of them may be not so good. But it's, it's trying to at least confront some of these issues. Um, for a long time, we didn't. We just ignored them. We just pretended these, these were not problems. And they were problems. Well, and when you start talking to people about the regulatory commissions and how they decide who gets paid and all, it, it's kind of like that really awful word problem that everybody just kind of glosses like, okay, whatever. Okay, you guys have it figured out. That's great. But all of that is part of these issues, right? I mean, all of that, it, it's almost like it comes home to roost at the nursing home because- when they initially started, they were taking Medicaid patients and Medicare patients, and it would balance out. And, you know, you had a certain amount of number. And now I feel like that has gone out the door. And now what's been what's been happening is part of this strain. And I feel like CMS comes up with their own logic that the consumer has no idea about. But everybody that deals with the nursing homes know full well how to work it and how to maneuver it and how to make it to go to their benefit. And the consumer's like, well, I don't know. I think this is a good place. And meanwhile, all of these, and I, I hate to say back room deals, but that's what it feels like as a consumer. All of this is happening over there and we have no idea. And I don't know how that that is fixed because again, that's more of the same. It's a business model. This is their business model. This is how they have to do it to remain in business. It doesn't necessarily help us. It doesn't help the people that are living there, but this is their business model. So how does that change? Or does it change? Or how do we make that better? So, so part of the problem goes back to what I was saying before, that there's a, there's a, there's a gap between consumers and payers. Right. And any business is going to listen to the people who pay them. In anything else we do, the customer is the payer, right? I, I, I go into a store and I buy a shirt and I bring it home and I discover the shirt's got a rip in it. I go back and I say, I paid you for that shirt. Give me a new shirt. Right. The nursing home business is not the same thing. The customer, the consumer, the, the older adult who's living there, their family members don't pay. So that, that disconnect between where the revenue comes from and who the, the customer is, to my mind, is a fatal flaw in the system. Yeah. I've proposed for years the idea of creating a public long-term care insurance program. One of the great benefits of that program is 
the customer and the payer become the same person. I'm, I'm now taking that money from this federal program that I paid for, and I'm going to the nursing home and saying, if you don't clean up your act, I'm not going to use you. That still requires other things. It requires more transparency. You know, I, I need more information as a consumer about what this nursing home is really like. And to its credit, CMS is trying to provide some of that. It's moving too slowly in my mind, but it's trying to trying to improve quality of, uh, and transparency. But fundamentally, I think that, that, that until the money comes out of the pocket of consumers and they need to get that money from somewhere, the system's never really going to be fixed. And you can disagree with that if you want. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <clears throat> because I don't, you know, I, I just kind of the analogous private pay system is assisted living. And it's certainly less grim <laughs> than a nursing home and that the industry argues constantly for differentiation. <laughs> um, that's kind of the whole point of it. But I think it's still shockingly slow to innovate to try to meet the needs of the of the residents and the families and you know one assisted living operator said to me not that long ago you know he's like you know we have we were created as sort of the answer to nursing homes and with like really trying to kind of fill in all of the gaps in people's lives and now we've sort of it, we're not doing it and and maybe part of one of the biggest challenges that I see in talking to caregivers of all socioeconomic means, whether they're in a nursing home or their parents in a nursing home or assisted living or at home, is this incredible disconnect between what we, what are industries that provide daily supports and services, whether, you know, like a nursing home or assisted living or a home care agency and the medical system. This is especially annoying and problematic when somebody lives in assisted living or a nursing home, because in theory, that should be an environment that really supports like efficient delivery of primary care and preventative care. And, you know, you should be getting like really easy access to vaccines and to labs and to pharmacy and like pharmacy management. And yet, even in those settings where you have literally everybody there is somebody who has a really high need, there, there's like the healthcare stuff is just far flung and disorganized. And then that family caregiver is left to essentially be the Sherpa of all things healthcare, whether you're in a nursing home or assisted living. So that problem exists and a lot of problems exist, even though people do have their own private resources to deploy. So I feel like Howard, the thing I would layer onto what you're saying is, yes, we need to have more sort of consumer power, but also somehow we need to have a better way of articulating like what is good and what is not good and who is good and who is not good. And that's incredibly hard because what's good for you you know, you had a good experience because your mom had a good aid and this person, and then I had a bad experience and also families. And I can say this can be really difficult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. We're not the easiest people to deal with because <laughs> we're all like, Wah! so another, I think another interesting piece of this, and I think Andrew just hinting at it is, is the care management. Yes. Part. Thank you. And <laughs> And that's the piece that's, that's missing for so many people. You know, Anne's written beautifully about this, about, about what it's like to have to play all these roles. At the time, you're under enormous pressure because, you know, your dad's very sick and, and you're trying to make sure your mother's holding it together. But you've got to deal with the home care agency and the doctor and the pharmacy and all this. And it's really hard. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've got the dough and if you understand it, you can hire navigators, you can hire geriatric care managers who can do this work, but most people can't. So what can we do to make sure that there's somebody in this process to put it all together? You know, Ann and I, for a long time, have both been very interested in the, in the opportunity that Medicare Advantage provides. Mm -hmm. Because Medicare Advantage, of course, is an environment where it's in the interest of the insurance company 
to reduce healthcare costs. And if they can use care management or supportive services to keep people out of the hospital and keep costs down, it's a win-win for everybody. That's the potential. Right. It hasn't really achieved that potential yet, but it's the only place in our system where the incentives of the insurance company and the families are at least potentially aligned. And if we can get that to work right, I think that's an opportunity. Fee-for-service, it's so much harder because there isn't anybody putting this together. So there's the doctor and then there's the pharmacy and then there's the home care aid and, the, and the, there's no incentive for them to work together. But the problem with the Medicare Advantage plans is that they're also finding that way to then incentivize them and to create that into their own little business practice of we're going to rate you based on your condition and then they get more money based on that rate based on that score. So then you have those people taken care of. And then you have the other people that have silver sneakers, but they can't get their MRI. So it's, we're giving you all of these things, but we're not giving you the care that you need because that still costs us. And that still takes away from our bottom line. So it's almost, it's almost like in every situation, it comes down to the business model. Mm -hmm. So and how do we fix Medicare Advantage? So it, it does in fact achieve the potential that we both see in it. I know it's so frustrating. Um, the potential is there. So again, kind of back to what Howard was saying about the nursing homes, but now talking about just commercial insurance plans that now essentially supply the Medicare benefits to half of the Medicare population, you know, are sort of, I would call them policy tools. You know, so we federal government sits here and they make decisions about sort of how to pay for this stuff. What does that method of payment look like? What are the rules? What do you have to do? All of that stuff is very carefully thought through by really smart people. And, and you know, surprisingly, who do a lot of that work without politics intervening to a large extent. And yet it's clunky. And when you're talking about this, I mean, what I'm just struck by is just, it's so much money. It so much when I think about like, I don't know, I'm like forgetting what the like it's we're at like 600, 700 billion dollars a year in Medicare dollars, half of which is now going to these private insurance plans. So when you make one teeny tiny little tweak that changes the, how those dollars flow, like the entire industry goes, whoa. Mm -hmm. You, it's like steering a ship. If you've ever been sailing and you know you change your rudder just to a hair, and then all of a sudden all the wind goes out of your sail, that's what it's like. So I think we have a lot of work. I think these big engines will respond and do what we want them to do if we pay them to do it. We just have to figure out how to reward the right behavior. And I some of this is educating federal policymakers and the regulators who are so smart that this program is really not serving the needs of the frailest older adults yet and their families, but it could. And the one little tiny little shiny bright light in all of this is that we are seeing these plans begin to recognize that family caregivers are a thing. Mm -hmm. Just that little, that just that in and of itself is a big step forward. Well, and that's that's my other question. Because when you think about this and you look at all of this, it beats you down a little bit. Mm -hmm. So what do you see? Because, and I know that you say a, a lot of times you feel like there's a change coming. <laughs> there's a change coming. What would change look like in both of your perspectives? What do you feel? What do you see? What do you think is going to change? I'll give you my ideal state which we're not going to get to, but it's always nice to aim at the ideal state. Love it. So my ideal state is there is a fully coordinated, fully integrated healthcare and long-term care system that is easily accessible by people who need it. And that it goes back to the old triple aim that they used to talk about at the uh, you know, Institute for, for Healthcare Improvement, the idea that you get the right care at the right time in the right place. And that the context of that always was within the healthcare system. 
I would take that and broaden it out and say within the entire ecosystem of, of supportive services and medical care. And my ideal regulatory state, and Anne has heard me say this many times in the past, is the government says to the insurance companies and the providers, if you can provide good quality care, properly measured, we don't care how you do it. We are not going to give you thousands of pages of regulations telling you how to do it. We don't care. Just we, we want to know that at the end of the game, you are providing your members, your patients with the best possible quality of care and the best possible quality of life. And if you do that, do it any way you want. Problem is, the dual problem is, first of all, we don't know how to measure that end state very well. And the second thing is regulators are terrified of abuses, that if we don't write all the rules and tell people exactly what to do, that we're going to get in trouble. We're going to get hauled before Congress and we're going to get yelled at because we allowed this money to get wasted because, again, it's all government money and we allowed all these abuses. So getting there is not simple, but I have in my head what the there is. Now, Ann can tell us how to get there. Yeah, no, well, I just think it's so important to articulate a vision and Howard, I love your vision. And I, I think that I really kind of like, I get up every morning, trying to, like my personal purpose is how do we change? How do we change healthcare so that it is less complex and it is less expensive and it is, you know, it's simpler and more effective for everybody. And because I think it's the complexity and the cost that ultimately gets us all in the end. And what that looks like is something that's coordinated and integrated and where it makes sense and it's rational. And I, in terms of like, I do feel like the tectonic plates are just starting to kind of like vibrate under the surface because it, you know, just, just the fact that there's just a lot more all of a sudden in the ecosystem about family caregiving and connecting the dots that, you know, you have an older adult, you probably with a lot of needs, you probably there's a family member somewhere and that that's a connected thing. And that so I think there's some movement at the community level where smart sort of organizations that are dealing with this at the community level are trying to kind of come together and say, like, let's have a conversation about this. Now, there has to be better funding you know, for those community-based organizations and a new charter and sort of a whole new way. They've got to innovate who they are and how they do what they do. But ultimately, it has to be an infrastructure that's community-based. Because Rosanna and I talk about this all the time, you know, what works in Pittsburgh is not what's going to work in Atlanta, because these are very unique communities. So, um, and there's micro-communities within that, and we have all kinds of issues that people of color have to deal with and face that we hear about from our daughterhood circle leaders who are, are navigating that world. So all of that has to happen at the community level, but and there has to be support for that at the state and the federal level. And I I think ultimately that's how it's gonna get, how we're gonna begin to get some resolve around this. And maybe that's that's sort of my vision ultimately is that we all have a place to go, you know? Yeah in our communities where that we all know is there and we understand we're entering into this together. So it's an interesting thing. I'm, I'm, I'm on the board of a community-based organization, exactly like what Anne's talking about. And we are in the process of trying to develop a caregiver training and support program. Mm. And one of the big challenges we face is who's going to pay us for this. Right. Yeah. And hard to get an answer. Medicare won't pay for it. Medicaid doesn't pay for it. Um, private pay is going to be too expensive for a lot of people who really need it. You know, we can rely on philanthropy to start a program, but we can't rely on philanthropy to keep it going. So it's exactly what Ann said. This is this is a need that everybody sees, but nobody wants to pay for it. Well, and so Howard, just my idea, just I mean, just to connect these dots is that is that I have been. So we have these Medicare Advantage plans that are making lots and lots and lots of money that aren't yet quite doing what they need to be doing, but it's still offering a solution that addresses some problems. Then we have these community-based organizations that are trying to solve problems. And I really have this idea that what perhaps would be the cleanest and easiest thing to do would be to charge 
private insurers a user fee and they create a pool of funds out of user. You know what? You, you want to deliver healthcare in this market? You want to get all these lives and all this premium dollars for Medicare? Well, we have to fund essentially the community-based organizations that are going to help people navigate because you're not doing it and you can't do it very well. And rather than try to put these community-based organizations in a situation where they're having to like pitch to a Medicare Advantage plan, which doesn't work, let's just, everybody pays to create the infrastructure that the family caregivers need. I love that. You know, the, the big incentive, I think, for plans to do that is, goes back to what we were talking about before, when there's a labor shortage, when there are no aids to do mm -hmm. this work, essentially, the, the, the plans are going to have to rely more and more on the family members. But to get the family members to do it right, and again, let's put this entirely in terms of monetary uh, situation, to get the family members to get it right so that they don't mess up and, the, and, and their loved one doesn't end up in the hospital, uh, we're going to have to do something to train them and support them. So maybe that works. Maybe. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. What a great idea. Charge the insurance companies. What a great idea. Why hasn't somebody thought of that before? Why you somebody that? probably has. <laughs> <laughs> I think you got it shot down. Listen, between that and Howard, I love your idea on paying into a long-term care fund for yourself. Can you just, can you talk about that for a second? I, I think that's just brilliant because you can't save for this. Sure. So the idea, and it's not my original idea, but the idea essentially is that we would, we would create a public catastrophic long-term care insurance program. We would pay people a cash benefit. The idea is that you would be responsible for paying for a certain level of care for yourself. And that level might depend on how much income you got. And then once you exceeded that level, the government long-term care insurance policy would kick in. We did an analysis of a program a few years ago, which showed that you could give people $100 a day, uh, $3,000 a month in, in benefits, and they could use in cash benefits, and they could use that any way they wanted. And that could be purchased by raising the payroll tax by about six tenths of a percent. So for a median income family, that would cost 350 or 400 bucks a year oh, wow. for that. I have talked to a number of members of Congress about this idea. Many of them have said to me, what a great idea. We love it. We're not going to raise taxes to pay for it. Not going to happen. So that's the hurdle that we've got to get over. We've got to get politicians willing to say this is an important enough problem that we are going to be willing to raise taxes to pay for the solution. And by the way, one of the things they don't recognize is if you did that right, you could reduce Medicaid long-term care costs by as much as a third. Right. So they're paying for it anyway, but they're paying for it not in a dedicated fund. They're paying for it with the regular tax base and by borrowing the money, which of course politicians love to do. This would be a program that was fully funded internally. So it wouldn't require anybody, the government, to borrow any more money. We, we would all be paying for it ourselves, but they're terrified of raising taxes. So we can't get it done. I have to tell you, though, that's a great one-two punch. And, and you two are a great one-two punch. <laughs> that idea of from both of you, I, I, I don't know. Let's try to advance that, shall we? I was trying to explain, like, it's a math problem. Yeah. Like, we can't. Like I, everyone's like, oh, private sector, let people do what they want to do. But the problem is like, Roseanne, if you go out and buy long-term care insurance and I go out, but Howard doesn't and five other people don't, it doesn't work mathematically. This is like such a classic case of um, we have to share. Hmm. We have to share in the risk. And it's not perfect because yes, then it becomes a government program. And then like, we have to raise taxes if costs are higher than we expect, which they probably will be. And then it's like Republicans get upset and worried because of government spending. And, and these are problems that other countries are facing right now, like Germany, right. you know, France, everybody, they, they do this. It's called social insurance, but that's what it has to be. That's it. Yeah. That's the way forward. And as Ann says, and every other developed country in the world except for the United States and England, has a system something like what I described. It's a little different in every country, but it's more or less what I described. And it works. It does cost more than people think, and the taxes have to go up, and that's a problem. But it works. And um, we, we're Americans. You know, we're all John Wayne. We're going to take care of ourselves. 
And, you know, we buy insurance for everything else, right? We buy car insurance. We don't give it a second thought. We buy homeowners insurance. And it's the same model. And the private insurance long-term care model has failed. And nobody disagrees. I've been saying this for a long time. People used to disagree. Nobody disagrees anymore. No. You, you cannot buy true catastrophic long-term care insurance because the, the insurance companies won't pay for it. Right. As Zan says, the problem is the only people who want to buy it are the people who are sick or who think they're going to get sick. And insurance doesn't work like that. So ultimately, it's going to have to be some kind of a government program. Honestly, and this is a, a, another one of my really pessimistic thoughts, but honestly, you know, it's too late for my generation. It's too late for the baby boomers. Yeah. We, we've already messed it up for us. The, the issue now is, can we make this work for the Gen Xers who are turning 50? Yeah. I mean, um, that, that's how long we've put this off. Gen Xers are pretty tough. We're pretty <laughs> yeah, tough. Yeah, we don't expect anything. We're pretty tough. We don't expect <laughs> a thing from anybody. <laughs> but I agree with you. Yeah, and I'm not giving up on the baby boomers because we really need to figure out a way for you guys to get taken care of because we're tired already. Oh, we blew it. We totally blew it. You know? Yeah. So with all that being said, what are the next steps? What can we do going forward? The critical missing piece here is the family caregivers need to get themselves in front of politicians and they need to tell them this is what it's like and if you don't do something about it i'm going to go vote for the other guy that's it who is going to do something about it because this is killing me okay and i think we've got to organize ourselves better elevating the voice of the family caregiver in an organized way in order to impact change a big thank you to howard gleckman and ann tumlinson for being my guests today to learn more about Howard Gleckman, you can find him at howardgleckman.com, and you can find Anne's blogs, resources, and support group circles at daughterhood.org. I hope you enjoyed our podcast today. Head over to daughterhood.org and click on the podcast section for show notes, including the full transcript and links to any resources and information from today's episode. You can find and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Daughterhood the Podcast and on my blog, heyrow.com. Feel free to leave me a message and let me know what issues you may be facing and would like to hear more about. Or even if you just want to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. Also, a very special thank you to Susan Rowe for our theme music, the instrumental version of her beautiful song, Mama's Eyes, from her album, Lessons in Love. I hope you found what you were looking for today. Information inspiration, or even just a little company. This is Roseanne Corcoran. I hope you'll join me next time in Daughterhood.